even before we arrived at Pripyat, 80 kilometers away from the town, we were surprised to see the sky. The sky was purple, with a crimson glow above the power plant, which made it look unlike any other nuclear plant. Having had experience from other jobs, I could estimate the equivalent yield of the explosion to be 3 to 4 TNT tons. Repeated analysis of volatile compounds found no influx of short-lived isotopes. This was the main evidence of the remaining fuel being in a subcritical state after the reactor had been demolished. After the primary assessment, when we understood that the reactor was not working, we had the following concerns. The fate of the population, the staff count at the station, and the personnel who had to maintain the station despite the destruction. These were the first questions. Also, we had to predict how the remaining fuel mass will behave after the reactor had been destroyed. We had to define the geometry foresee all possible situations and choose a course of action. By the end of April 26, all possible ways of quenching the reactor core with water have been tried with no effect. Instead, the water extensively evaporated and overflowed to transfer floors in the neighboring reactor. It was clear that the firefighters did a quick and accurate job in the first day when they brought the fires in the Turbine Island under control. Some people tend to think that a lot of firefighters got high radiation doses because they stayed close to the reactor to look for fire hazard. Some people judged them, believing this decision to be wrong and ignorant. This is not the case. The Turbine Island had a lot of oil and hydrogen within the generators. There had been a lot of fire and explosion hazards that could potentially destroy the reactor number 3 at the Chernobyl power plant. Therefore, the firefighters acted heroically, but also skillfully, correctly and efficiently. They were first to take accurate measures to contain the emergency. Another concern appeared when we realized that a strong flux of radioactive aerosol gas was pouring out of the reactor aperture at the reactor number 4. It was clearly graphite burning and each graphite particle carried a lot of radioactive sources. We had a complex problem to solve. Typically graphite burns at nearly a ton per hour. 2,500 tons of graphite had been deposited at the reactor number 4. Hence, if it was burning in a usual way this mass of graphite could take 240 hours to burn, dispersing radioactivity along with its combustion products across a vast territory. The temperature inside the demolished reactor was likely limited by the graphite burning temperature, around 1500 degrees, or a bit higher, but not much higher. It would come to a kind of an equilibrium. In this way, the fuel Uranium oxide pellets would melt and would not contribute to radioactive species influx. However, the flux of radioactivity, along with the combustion products, for many days would contaminate a huge territory with radioactive species. Because of the radiometry readings, we could only extinguish the core from above, at least from 200 meters above the reactor core. We had no appropriate machinery to extinguish graphite in a conventional way, with water and foam. We had to come up with unconventional methods. I should mention that our studies were backed up by consultations with Moscow. For example, we were keeping a secure phone connection with Anatoly Petrovich Alexandrov. A number of employees from the Nuclear Energy Institute and from the Ministry of Energy took part in the discussions. Each service group, such as firefighters, 
were communicating with their Moscow branches. On day two, we were telegraphed with various suggestions. Foreign colleagues suggested to extinguish the burning graphite with all sorts of mixtures. We made a decision based on the following considerations. First, we had to inject as many boron-containing compounds as possible. In a case of fuel moving or in other emergencies, they would effectively absorb a lot of neutrons from the reactor aperture. Luckily, we had a lot of uncontaminated boron carbide in a warehouse, 40 tons which was dropped from helicopters into the reactor aperture. The first problem, which was to inject as much neutron poison as possible, was solved quickly. The second task was to inject compounds that would stabilize the temperature that would spend energy coming from the powerful fuel decay on phase transitions. The first idea that I suggested was to inject into the reactor as much iron shot as we could. We had enough iron shot at the station. It was added to concrete during construction to make it heavier. It turned out, firstly, that the warehouse with the iron shot was covered with the primary explosion cloud and working with the heavily contaminated shot was impossible. Secondly, we did not know the possible equilibrium temperature. If, for example, the mass average temperature of the fire was lower than the iron melting point, injecting iron would not be enough. We would have missed the opportunity to stabilize the temperature at the lower point. Because of this, we chose two components after multiple consultations and discussions. Lead and dolomite. Lead is firstly a metal that melts at a low temperature. Secondly, it has some capacity to extract radioactive species. Thirdly, when lead solidifies in colder spots, it creates a gamma radiation screen. This was, of course, a correct decision. Naturally, there was a risk. If the temperature was substantially higher, a large share of the lead might evaporate, typically at 1600 to 1700 degrees. In this case, lead would contaminate the land in addition to radioactive contamination and would not play its part. The group from the Ukraine Ministry of Energy, coming from Donetsk, was at my disposal. With the Swedish machinery and thermal cameras, they were constantly flying over the reactor number 4 to monitor its surface temperature. This was a complex task. The thermal camera sensors were semiconductor based and we had to account for powerful gamma radiation hitting the semiconductors when we interpreted the measurements. I suggested to complement the air-based thermal camera measurements with direct thermocouple ground-based measurements. Evgeny Pietrovich Yazantsev and the helicopter pilots did this. They used long heliards to lower the thermocouples to the reactor. It was hard to measure surface temperature. Finally, since the graphite was still burning, I suggested taking air samples from different spots in the reactor and sending them to Kiev. By determining the CO and CO2 components and their ratio, we could assess, albeit with low accuracy, the maximal temperature within the reactor number 4. All of these data led us to believe that there are small, high temperature spots within the reactor number 4. The maximal temperature we detected was 2000 degrees. Most surfaces were at the temperature no higher than 300 degrees.